Well, g'day everyone and welcome back to the Voice of a Veteran podcast. We are here live on set from mum's back deck. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> and I'm back here with Sam. Sam, good to see you. Hello. Thank you. Great well, to see you. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, what are we doing today? Well, I have one question from the audience. Ah, questions. How did people send through these questions? There was some Instagram DMs. There was some Facebook messages. Okay. There was some lovely messages that came through on email as well, just with good responses from the last few podcasts, which Excellent. is great to hear. Very keen to get into this feedback. So you can do, what is it? Hello at Voice of Veteran. We'll go to our Instagram at voice underscore of underscore a underscore veteran or our Facebook and send those messages through and Sam will get them in. Yeah. And today I've chosen one in particular because I feel like it will link in with where I want to take this conversation. And the context is, context. I feel like there's been lots going on in the veteran community. You've been speaking a lot on veterans issues, like on Royal Commission, on terms of reference, on very heavily basis veteran stuff. Uh huh. And there's also a lot of questions that come up on just skills in general that you learn in the military, that you learn in leadership, that you learn in life. And yes. I want to talk about that stuff today. Okay, good. Be nice change of pace. Yeah, another reason is because we have a lot of listeners that aren't veterans themselves. Very true. That maybe no veterans, but I also feel like these types of conversations are relevant to people like me. That's just... You're right. And that was the whole purpose. The originally founding Voice of Veteran was to talk out with regards to mental health. It's just that a lot of these causes and campaigns have got along the way, but this is really back to where the true purpose and fulfilment is. So happy to go back to basics for sure. Okay, before we dive in, let's check in with you then. Where are you at? How are you going? And I was meant to keep you accountable for your fitness and stuff, so let's uh, check in on that too. Oh, it's been all right. It's been all right. Um, like I told you, I have a Barry Crocker or a shocker of a headache today, but you are putting that down to some form of moon eclipse <laughs> last night. We're not getting into that. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, Sam's quite grounded and earthy. I'm good. We have Copper down by your feet, sunning himself. Magical little puppy. Uh, Fitness has been pretty good. Getting back into uh, morning cardio and getting back into my gym, but not quite there yet. But, I mean, developments are looking to step it up a notch Um, next week. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) not holding myself accountable yet, but we're going to get there. Yeah, cool. And just a brief overview of, like, what's been going on in your world the last two weeks. Uh, Yeah, well, we really got to that. Uh, planning conference up here in Brizzy, got the submissions to the Attorney General, um, which was pretty overwhelming. We had over 865, or we had 865, and then summarising um, a lot that's come out of that, and then trying to put forward essentially some key decision briefs for some of the key outcomes from that meeting. Really, really encouraged by the amount of will for a lot of the ex-service organisations to join together and collaborate, again, specifically for the purpose of supporting this Royal Commission. So my whole head um, is really racing forward to what steps we can take here and now to make sure we're setting up this proactive support base, including volunteers and everything, um, you know, really converting so much of these offers, these offers of support that people have given us to make sure, again, we have these proactive support, outreach and follow-up capabilities, um, much like we didn't have during um, other inquiries. So the time frame is now working towards the start of July uh, and trying to be a little bit more self-paced in bringing in other people to our team as we've spoken about in the development of this new organisation and uh, Voice of the Veteran turning into this new um, not-for-profit charity but most importantly impact organisation that is going to be designed to specifically focus on supporting the Royal Commission and is going to have a board of directors um, and I'm simply just going to be a member of the force for good. So really looking forward to that but it's still, as always, a bit of a sprint until then. So. Yeah, you briefly spoke about in the terms of reference video or the conference video that people can find on Voice of a Veteran YouTube if you want to check out some of the segments from that. That's right, we live recorded, yep. But you you actually mentioned in there the closing off of Voice of a Veteran yeah. and the start of, so what, what now? <laughs> so what, what now? The next step is Veteran Support Force, which is uh, an organisation that is specifically structured within the constitution of only being around as long as the Royal Commission is around to specifically focus and support uh, our community, including our families, during the conduct of this Royal Commission, to um, actively reach out and engage with veterans and their families to help them figure out and even facilitate how to provide submissions to this Royal Commission, and then to conduct um, physical uh, follow-up with them, not just, you know, leave it to a, hey, if you've been traumatised by coming forward or this has stirred up anything, please call this number, but having someone who... 
uh, is a like-for-like like relatable person to follow up and call that person, meet with that person, conduct community events to bring that together. And that's not just us. That's working with a whole raft of other ex-service organisations who already do this, but trying to concentrate our efforts, be more efficient in how we can help provide fundraising for them through to our government policy. As you would have heard from that meeting, even changing, uh, working with state and federal um, health uh, elements to change the standard operating procedure for when someone presents to a clinic or a hospital that has uh, suffered or conducted suicidal ideation or behaviour, you know, to include a screening process to determine if they're a veteran and then linking in with a local support network that we're going to go and develop. So there's some really key actionable steps, but now it's time to really focus on that ground up practical, tactical actions and uh, maintaining um, political and strategic relationships to help facilitate policy to support our people. Now that we have this authority, it's all about getting back to supporting that groundwork that is our people and our families. Mm, and I know we didn't intend on going into this conversation right now. Yeah, but you lied to me. <laughs> why um, Why is Voice of a Veteran not that thing, do you think? And, and, and why is that closing? Uh, Voice of a Veteran as we've said before, was that platform that I needed to be comfortable in putting myself forward and speaking out aggressively, assertively on these issues to be able to accept risk from a legal framework as well. Um, but it has been fantastic in providing the cut through needed and in forming the trust of our community. It's also brought, um, again, as I said, that conference plenty of hate, which is fine. And it's time to uh, have me take a step back to allow um, no form of uh, personal inferences or opinions or attitudes or otherwise to get in the way of what needs to be concentration of force supporting our people. So, you know, as per any campaign plan, I never went into this thinking about just one single phase. We're now onto the next phase, and that's really um, stepping back and addressing the key areas only I can support, but really helping and facilitating others to get in there and do the heavy lifting, which really is needed more than one organisation can do and that's by our powers and experience and personalities and preferences combined and that's phase two which is veteran support force coming soon. Mm. Yeah that's good and I think we moved so quick in voice of a veteran too and always had the idea of oh maybe we should do it as a charity or a not-for-profit but really it had the yeah. it, the flexibility to do what it needed to do yeah, that's with the it. way that we set it up. I mean, look, even learning on the go what it needed to set up a charity, you know, I poo-pooed that decision within two minutes of reading all the bloody governance I had to go through. So, but that's what we've been working on the last, well, oh, nearly, nearly two months now. We've been drafting this constitution for Veteran Support Force and engaging with other people to be directors and going through the accounting policy requirements. And I mean, it's been a great learning curve <laughs> to realise what goes into this and just to make sure we do it properly. So... I'm really looking forward to um, presenting that hopefully just in time for the new financial year to be prepared before the Royal Commission is established to make sure again we have that preparatory framework in place um, ready to be proactive and reactive not just one or the other. Mm, stay tuned on that. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay let's roll into Kimsey's question. Kimsey? Kim Kimsey? I think it's Kimsey. Get it Kimsey. Okay she says how do you stay grounded and know how to set boundaries when people ask so much of you? Uh, I don't. I'm not very good at saying no. Uh, and that's directly from my psychiatrist during this week's session. <laughs> uh, given my love language is acts of service and I pour my identity into that too much. Uh, as we've said on previous podcasts, I am fantastic at uh, pouring myself into purpose, uh, particularly to support others. You know, this it's just something very um, inspiring, but also... Um, burdening when someone comes to you with a problem that, um, not a problem that you can see that they're just being lazy, but a problem that they, it literally has hit them now at an emotional level where uh, they are coming to you looking for support. And that is where I find it so hard to say no, particularly if I know I can take it on and I regularly do, but uh, to my own detriment, to my own headspace. And that's, this last seven months has been such a key inside of that. You know, I've been used to um, huge workloads overseas on deployments, all that, and I've said on previous podcasts, I was never, I never had mental health or stress. I was just busy. Uh, whereas particularly, and that's been that critical capability and enable that's been missing is that full support network, community, um, team structure. That's a big missing part that I had on all those other deployments and military examples. Um, you know, you and I um, have been a fantastic team. And if, if I didn't have you here, I wouldn't be grounded at all. I'd be... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
I'd be somewhere lost up in the Alps, just living in a monk's cave and zenning out or something. You'd um, be very grounded if that was the case. No, but I'd be completely unproductive. <laughs> You're right. I'd, I'd actually probably be like in a straitjacket with my hair frizzed out like I just put a fork in a PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> but I think key part for me, keeping grounded, is even being like the first things first, you know, as I told you before, we I properly stepped up, voice of a veteran. Uh, actually, no, just after I stepped it up and when the Bruton report got released and the tempo just went through the roof, you know, the, you were the person I reached out to. I was like, hey, I need help. Um, I need you to provide structure. I need you to provide insight. I need you to provide a non-military um, brain to this. And your incredible organisational skills have been that. And then it's actually been piecing together through the conduct of this because I sort of really scrubbed all of those people around me apart from key family members um, during COVID and during my, own, during my own mental health degradation over the last year to then reach back out to. Like I've told you, you know, my sister's been so huge and always keep me grounded, always keep me accountable. Even when you know the media started to really jump on and love me with things, she was the first person to say, hey, cool, so why are you having this interview? Like what's the purpose? It's not to go out there and cut someone else down who said something against the veteran community. It's in order to be positive and proactive and, you know, just having those pre-briefs beforehand have been amazing. And then there's been some other key friends um, that have really helped support me and just, again, been there just to be there for me as opposed to being there for needing something or wanting something. And that's been that quality time that I've talked about, you know, those people who've really been able to achieve um, what I need to feel valued and that's just being an around and with me for through thick or thin without a required outcome they've been those that are key in supporting but even in particular you know in lead up to that conference last the other friday and since then as you've seen there's more and more people that are coming to us um, aligned on the purpose but at the same time are there at that community um, foundation level and have the runs on the board of proven demonstration of competence and character in supporting our veteran community so the the support and the stability and the groundingness is still on a slope up but I genuinely sit here saying to you that I have not got it right but I am genuinely full of optimism and positivity noting just what we've already seen by again getting there out there and taking action so far and now trusting that you know because it's no longer just voice of the veteran it's now got an operational purpose that is finite um, to be able to step back maintain my infinite outlook on things and bring in a team that I can, you know, trust and I can step back and I can let go of a lot of the micromanagement I've had to take over for a number of reasons over the last seven months. Mm. So taking away the external support net you have for purposes of keeping you grounded, you know, I know I'm not going anywhere. I know Tally's not going anywhere. I know people aren't going to go anywhere, but if you were to Better mention mum. Mum's been huge. And like I said, even quickly moving up here, selling my unit in Sydney, moving up here and living out of mum's place, you know, to be able to have that daily support, um, that daily verbal engagement with a lot of these things. And some of them are like very sensitive, as you know, as well, through to just having (laughs) good nutrition, (laughs) watching uh, Copper fall absolutely madly in love with her. It is so... Fascinating. Just saying, I, I've lost Copper as a dog. He's <laughs> infatuated with my mother, but he still obeys and listens to me. But even that's just been so warm to see that, you know, true affection. Even watching, you know, it open up this new love chamber for my mother. Um, yeah. So being so grounded and I've had to really immerse myself in my community as opposed to sitting back and choosing to engage in it when I wanted to. Mm. And I think that's all a part of that pendulum swing. And now it's about just finding where I need to rest in the middle. Um, as opposed to just continuously going from one extreme to the next. Yeah. So outside of people, yes. uh, what do you do or what could you do or what do you feel like you need to do in order to keep yourself more grounded on a day-to-day basis? Ooh, fitness is a big one for me, as you know. Uh, my ability to get in there and actually do something physical that I'm able to sort of disengage, not disengage my brain, but disengage my strategy thinking brain and really just be able to focus on task. And as definitely you, activates your creative brain. Yeah, as you know, that's when when I'm actually removing these, you know, what is it, left side, right brain? When my brain isn't thinking in the operational mode, mm. that is when, if everyone doesn't know, like I'll be at the gym and next thing I'm texting notes to Sam and writing down <laughs> TED Talk propositions and all this, and it's good stuff. <laughs> and it's stuff that I can't think of when I'm there focusing on it. It just flows to me. So fitness is a huge thing. And even... As random as it sounds, and the best thing about having, you know, a dog is getting out there and going for a walk. 
as weird as it sounds, like I always feel like I should be going for a run, you know, doing something more at a high performance level. But particularly now up here in Queensland, you know, what is it, 23 degrees today and getting out in the morning and maybe even again in the afternoon and just going for a walk and putting the phone down or leaving it in at home and actually watching him walk and looking out and around and taking some appreciation of the surroundings, even if it's 30 minutes, that's been like a big thing that I really need to do more of and have really found um, has been a much more grounding bring back to live in the moment um, activity. And that's the biggest issue for me is head always goes to long-term, long-term, long-term planning. Um, and even working with you, particularly where you've, you keep bringing up some of our own old content and Sam just has this incredible ability of just to keep going back through um, all the things we've done beforehand, whereas my head's sort of like, oh, we've done that, move on. And she'll bring out these segments and even looking at some of the original segments we did like six or seven months ago and literally getting to see that the same message is still true. I even feel like I said things better <laughs> back then as well because there was more space for that creativity and that, mm. that flow and that awareness to go through and then just even taking that time to work with you to reflect back. So trying to bring myself from all the way out here at least back to having a bit more living in the moment and then being further assisted by every now and then actually conducting some critical and positive reviews is really helping to try and, you know, bring in at least a bit more stability and balance um, to that process. Yeah, that's good. Why do you think we need these moments of the gym or for me, it's like driving long distances yeah. or like sometimes people will be like, I get all my best ideas in the shower. Like why, why do you think we need these moments where we, I don't know, find our creative outlet to disconnect from our brain? Yeah, I'm unsure. I mean, I've said this before where my last deployment to Iraq in 2016, 2017, my role was the, uh, the joint plans officer for the special operations um, coalition and I, had, I was working with a, an amazing team of very smart people, including, you know, a former U.S. fighter pilot and a um, SAMS graduate and all this. But our role was to not plan anything less than it was six months out from commencing. So there was a six months buffer. You know, as soon as it came into that buffer, then we passed it to the operations team. And the fact to be able to create this time and space gap whereby we had the opportunity to actually sit down and critically review and discuss and plan things. I remember from a, a personal mindset was, was incredible as opposed to dealing with the spot fires and dealing with the daily operational critical needs. There's always a place to be able to sit there and ground yourself in a creative process, apply absolute logic and structure, but really enable your headspace to not be dealing with any form of stress activation, any form of cortisol, any form of that biology that goes with stress or the immediate requirement, including adrenaline, to really get through a product and deliver. And then to be able to do that, that deployment, what was I there for like four months, a little bit more, and to be able to do that over a sustained period of time. I even remember my um, fitness regime and my um, nutrition and my sleep, all these things. I was in such a better mindset, which was fascinating because at that time in Iraq, uh, I remember it was particularly when uh, ISIS had developed the technology to start um, dropping 40 mil high explosive grenades and all this from, you know, those little gyrocopter drones. You yeah. know, they had this regular um, propaganda piece where they were flying these drones over Iraqi coalition forces and dropping them. They were actually putting cameras on the end of the 40 mil bombs when they dropped them as well. And these were, you know, these were these terrible... Um, propaganda videos they were talking about how they were killing and maiming people and you know that was a capability we'd never really identified as a threat in a conventional war zone even unconventional war zone you know we had the big proper high flying uavs dropping bombs and all this but you know we would never we'd always had air superiority whereas these could be picked up by anyone and the amount of air drills we had just there in our comfortable headquarter um forward operating base and you would have seen from even uh, one of my videos when one night laying in bed on Snapchat, there was a rocket attack came in and landed about 100 metres from her bed. It was probably the most like um, 
uncertainty or even potential lack of security or actual risk I'd ever had during my um, vulnerable times, during the times where I wasn't all geared up outside the wire. But it was just fascinating for me where my mindset was like so crystal clear and I wasn't out there doing all the cool stuff, but the ability to actually have that time and space in my professional requirements really enabled better alignment on my personal and personality side of the house. And it really was a very fascinating nexus for me to appreciate what can be achieved, um, you know, even in a corporate perspective when we get into proper strategy um, to create the conditions for uh, conducive, professional, deep diving, learning and, and mindset and everything else in between. I understand that a lot of people, uh, when they transition from defence, have problems with discovering their purpose or who they are or, you know, do you think there's benefit in creating this time and space to disconnect from perhaps the uh, the spiral stuff or the hard stuff that's going on through your head and the things that you're dealing with and you might be able to talk to what the other stuff is? Yeah. Like, how, do, how does someone looking for their purpose outside of military create that space to be able to get creative and then what might be what might come of that does that make sense yeah well i mean the whole thing we've spoken about i love the analogy of the pendulum the pendulum swing yeah like we move that water like you said uh you know particularly in service life so much is provided for you and we keep talking about this unique nature of service that's all immersive your community your purpose and your sense of identity deeply embedded in what you're doing each and every day and it's an infinite process you know the defense of our country isn't measurable in time and space it's measurable in ultimate result with a lot of finite objective objectives along the way but then in particular you know when a lot of people leave because they've just got to that place where they've lost their purpose you know they will immediately swing to something to try and fulfill immediate purpose because once you have that purpose that is so truly inspiring at an intrinsic level uh, it's like a drug it's so hard to replace that and it makes you feel better in every single thing that you do and it empowers you to be better in every single thing that you do. On a previous podcast with Scotty, you heard me talking about, you know, training for a purpose in our physical fitness and how much it's very easy to lose motivation these days because I don't have, you know, a physically required purpose apart from my only health and wellness and maybe looking good at the beach in summer. But as we're entering winter, that wanes even more. So the requirement to... Or the, it's so easy to throw ourselves into that purpose whereby, and this is even something we're talking about, not just for the military, but for anyone who is responsible for managing people in any form of workplace, how powerful um, using leave and holidays are. You know, I used to have this sort of formula whereby, you know, I'd take two weeks of vacation from work and you're sort of like, oh, you know, you're sort of trying to throw yourself into it and have fun, but your head's still thinking about what you could have been doing at work either way and then when you get to week three and week four, you're kind of in a place of like, hey, you know, I'm sort of actually living in the now, in that rhythm, you know, not really missing work too much. I'm very happy where I am. Then you come to week five and week six and you're kind of like, yeah, cool, I'm enjoying myself, but, you know, kind of keen to get back there. It's nearly been five and six weeks now. You know, I'm sure the, the place isn't working as well without me or, or whatever. And what you actually do is you sort of lose your purpose and you rediscover your purpose. And it might be going back to the same purpose, but... That's why I'm really trying to push how hard it is. You know, I used to, my personal example in the military itself, I and mean, I saved up until I had over 100 days worth of leave in my book, which you're not meant to do, but I kept being operationally deployed and required and all that. And if I maybe had have taken better blocks, I also had my long service leave on that, you know, I would have probably been in a better place whereby my purpose might have at least been more sustained, more renewed, you know. Defence as an employer, they might would have retained me longer. But, you know, I was the master of my own destiny and that was the choice. But applying that to particularly when people go through a transition piece, I think it's fantastic. You need to, like, realise that you need just a little bit of time to rediscover you, to focus on the here and now, to maybe consolidate a bit of your sense of self. And particularly for many people uh, and particularly for veterans in that transition space, so many of us have saved up our injury claims, our paperwork, you know, even what it takes to become a proper civilian, like getting a Medicare card, finding a new GP. There's this long list of to-do lists and that becomes our immediate purpose and we throw ourselves into it. And the issue is that long list takes a long time to complete and keeps going, particularly once you start realising what is available to you and it just keeps going and going and going. So I think it's two parts. So important to push that as far upstream so you're not doing it to the last minute, but then giving yourself that time and space to have a clean break and to 
go on a vacation, to go chill out somewhere, to grab that book that you've always wanted to read and go and take a moment to just enjoy being yourself and provide that detox. You know, it's a mental detox. And I've spoken with so many people about, do you remember that, the, the national lockdown, um, what was it March last year or March, April last year? Uh, how many people, you know, hated that first week? They've been by the second week, they're kind of like, hey, I'm cleaning the house more than I ever used to. I'm rediscovering this. I self-taught myself how to do videos on YouTube. You know, I'm actually doing daily workouts. I'm spending more time with my kids. You know, we're sitting around the dinner table. You just, <laughs> all these common sense things. You know, imagine, uh, one thing I would love to do is on each anniversary of that national lockdown, do like a <laughs> lockdown detox camp or something like that. But I just remember again how mentally aligned i was actually during that lockdown and as you know for we me we did a podcast remember yeah on my one and it was decluttering your life that's it yeah decluttering your life i think it's so important particularly during those transitions in your life mm. to harness the opportunity to provide that decluttering and particularly as you're progressing from one culture to the next and one community to the next potentially you know refocusing and readjusting what your immediate support network is mm. yeah. I, you talk about layers of resilience a lot and mm. I want to bring up layers of busyness because yes. this relates to any human, I think. I've, I've worked with so many women. I've seen so many people that have latched on to this thing of busyness because I get it. The world's we, – we're busy people. Cool. Yep. But it takes layers of this ideal to strip off this busyness to be able to actually sit in the time and space and yep. allow yourself to be there. It's actually so hard to allow yourself to be there. Or take a day off or take a week off or, Absolutely. you know, I have a friend over in Canada, she's t- taking like three months off and I've been there for there like every week I check in with her yeah. because her journey of being able to actually take the leave because it was to do with emotional stuff, actually take the leave and then the first month was just like fighting that and needing to do the to-do list yeah. and then the, the next month was like you say, oh, actually, I'm kind of liking this. And then the third month is like, I'm finding all this new stuff that I want to do and I realise I love this about this. Yeah. And it's it's and that's where she might discover. that's why she might actually discover like a new purpose. If yeah. you're not so motivated to go back to what you were doing, that's that place where it's just like, hey, you know, what inspires me next for sure. Yeah. I think it comes from a place where in this, excuse me, this modern day of, you know, how accessible all information is, you know, there's always something going on around us or in our pockets, in our devices, on our computers. So we're sort of um, compelled to think that we need to be much more proactive than, and much more productive than we are, you know. To be able to simply sit back and yeah. say, hey, I'm not doing anything today, the society's almost shifted to a place where everybody's like, uh, don't you have something to do? Yeah. You know, we always feel like we have something to do as opposed to, no, I'm taking today for me. You know, people always think, you know, particularly with social media, if you're not doing anything, you can always jump on your social media and potentially work on your own brand, potentially work on... Um, you know, communicating with people, you know, we've turned that into our, our digital friend space as opposed to actually much more getting out there and interacting with each other. So I don't know about you, but I really feel like there's been much of a, a cultural shift, particularly in our generation that, you know, just simply having spare time, unless you're like dedicating time to meditate or things like that, it's kind of not okay to not be doing anything. You feel guilty uh, and you feel lazy or you sort of, that judgmental shame factor comes into it where you're like, oh, you know, am I being the best? Because everything's like, be the best you can be. Mm. Whereas it's actually appreciating that sometimes being the best you can be also needs to be doing nothing to enable the best part of you to, to have a rest and come back up. And that doesn't mean that you're available. This is something that I've been learning mm. recently. I like that. Because I was shocking at, at this, but I've been so dedicated to what we're doing and yeah. fulfilled in purpose and satisfied and lit up and, and energised to do that, that I've... I've chosen to do that and then on the, on the off days I'm like filling up my tank. So I'm ta- I'm like working out the balance of what I need to fill up my tank and that typically means that I'm like out in the jungle by myself or hiking or doing stuff by myself to fill that up. Not rolling your ankle. Tip, sometimes I do that. Sam has <laughs> rubber ankles, people. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times I have we gotten. We don't need to bring that up. Well, I have gotten <laughs> pictures of Sam with her leg elevated and a new swollen <laughs> ankle. From Look. slipping on her driveway. Yeah, but when I'm not, so that means that when I'm not in alignment and like I'm not choosing to fill my tank up, my ankle will do it for me. That is very true. <laughs> Sam has very tangible uh, warning signals when I have to tell her to unplug for a day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but even better, she's mm. like, okay, my ankle's rolled. Is there any work you need for me? 
Or we have copper whining. Copper, come here. Hey. Come here. Oh. Bring copper to the table. Um, yeah, but Puppy break. By, by doing that, it doesn't mean that I'm available, which is something that I've had to really learn to put up boundaries and say, cool, I'm actually very introverted today and I just need my own space. Yeah. And uh, usually that's hard for me to do that with family or friends or feeling like I should be doing something else. But it's also so, it's been so good for me this year. Yeah, good. I mean, I've definitely seen that. And that's where I've been actually so impressed with your work ethic. And I haven't, particularly in that first four months, I was definitely like, yes, finally somebody can sort of keep up with me. But to be honest, I then had to switch into a bit more of a manager mode and be like, hey, I'm taking a day off, you're taking a day off. <laughs> and we've needed to do that. We've maintained that and surge as need be. But it's so important, particularly in this day and age when, you know, even working from home and doing this sort of stuff, you know, there's no defined work week and you don't need to log into any special systems. Uh, so it's very easy to, you know, there's no delineation between home life and work life. And I mean, I love that, but that's all I've ever done. So I'm actually appreciating that, no, you kind of do need to actually start to set your own boundaries. But that's also a good thing with, uh, well, I think, with setting, being able to have freedom in your own schedule and freedom yeah. in what works for you. Like you give me the freedom to do what works for me. Yeah. And so therefore I'm more energised in being able to do that. Yeah, no, that's it. But I think it's also, you know, even for myself and my own boundaries, you know, once we sort of hit dinner time, that, that's it. Otherwise I'd always jump on my laptop again after that. And now I'm like actually making myself, you know, watch a tv show actually like even downloaded stan and things like this things i hadn't done before you know i know i have a whole pile of books i need to read yeah i get this but uh (laughs) finding that time where you can just sort of switch off the brain and not feel guilty being uh, not productive but actually it comes down to establishing boundaries for yourself appreciating that otherwise you're just actually impacting on your ability to enter into that creative space yeah i think that's so important for a lot of people if you are wanting to discover more about yep. purpose and whatever well, this also even, might link in with well just quickly linking yeah. in on that so even throughout my entire time in special forces you know there was always a time that you were even in the army in general there might have been a time where you are uh, always on call you know when we're on the domestic counterterrorism role i was still always on a notice to move and things like that but for the general part you actually couldn't bring your work home with you you might stay at work late to get things done, but you know there's a restricted system and there's a secret system. You can't access the secret system, or I couldn't access the secret system from home. You might be able to access the restricted system, and that might be just helping out with some soldier admin and stuff like that. But when you left work, you left work. And then when you turn up to work, you turn up to work. And your weekends, there was no work. We also didn't have social media. We weren't allowed to have social media. That was uh, demonstrated you, and I just didn't have it. Um, or I had it, and I just didn't really touch it. There was some very casual weekend stuff so you literally had no form of like digital interaction interface you didn't have emails coming through like there were no emails on phone notifications things like that so just truly remember that as far as maintaining a tempo of um maintaining and if not restoring purpose you know monday to friday we worked weekend was all about socializing to actually plan to do things on the weekend as opposed to oh i'm tired i'm doing nothing go again um, and then repeat. And then when you had to take leave and vacation, it was the same thing. You know, it was two, three, four weeks of completely unplugging. Um, there wasn't bringing work home with you. And it was just so impressive to appreciate how truly important that was to be proactive in maintaining that sort of space as opposed to being reactive as a sort of treatment form. Because then you'd go away on operation, operational deployments, for, you know, three, four, five, six, seven months and then come back and have extended leave breaks, Um, you actually managed quite well, but there were still areas to do it better, like I said beforehand. But uh, I, again, look at a lot more people in everyday society and everyday business these days where you can pretty much log on to any system anywhere, and particularly with COVID now working from home. I actually think that conversation about the requirement to have your own boundaries, and you can always be flexible in your own boundaries, particularly during surge requirements and things like that, but just appreciating that as per all these things, catches up on you. It's not all of a sudden, oh, it just hits me, but it's trickling up and, you know, it fills that bucket very, very quickly. We don't want to do an ankle. No, then you're rolling ankles or walking down driveways. <laughs> uh, how does this relate then to authenticity and your vulnerable self? Because do we need the time and space to be able to tap more into who we are on an authentic level if we haven't met that person yet? And also being our more vulnerable self. And this might be from your experience of, you you know, you talk about 
only in the last like year or so have you started to find your authentic and vulnerable self and so what was the process of you finding that and getting Oof. to know him uh i think it was just appreciating what matters and again i i think it really came down to me going to that unique place whereby i didn't think anything mattered you know that's my own suicidal ideation moment and sort of really don't conducting my own self-awareness and situational awareness analysis of where i got to and how i got to there uh, and then I guess even in particularly for me, you know, confessing to my mother and to my sister uh, and to some of my guys that I actually even went to that moment, which I was more scared of doing than, um, you know, even coming up my own sexuality because I really think, you know, like it was a huge failing, um, a big failing because it was something that I wanted to do to myself uh, and it was just against every part of the brand that I thought I was supposed to be, I wanted to be, I had built myself to be. So then it was from there and then seeing in particular um, the reactions, the support, the engagement and indeed what that brought out in so many others. And we've said this, how many of my other guys and how many other people I've spoken to then all of a sudden felt that that was their approval, their ability, their vulnerable safe zone to be able to say, well, yeah, wow, I didn't realise, yeah, I've actually been there as well. And not also, it wasn't like a hashtag me too it wasn't like, a, you know, out of sympathy. They were kind of like, you watch, you like literally watch them unlock this mental space of like, yeah, wow, you know, that's the sort of secret I've been holding on to as well. And then even just appreciating through the lens of responsibility, not entitlement, that just being more aware of yourself and accepting of yourself has been the biggest thing. I always kept comparing myself to the brand and the picture that is me with my beret on, with my uh, uniform, with my medals on, um, you know, or who I was in Afghanistan 2012 with my guys, actually finally being tested in combat um, and actually, you know, being at a place where I felt that I was um, the most validated uh, in my personal professional life uh, and actually appreciating that, yes, that, that was a time, but that's a responsibility and an opportunity to bring that forward and to better um, actually understand that life goes on, life changes. You know, even having conversations with people like on our previous podcasts, Tony Abbott and Ian Thorpe, and, you know, hearing these people who've been at the pinnacle of their respective profession and appreciating that, you know, the, the movie doesn't just finish with a great feel-good ending, like it goes on and life has highs and lows and you're actually much more relatable and much more real uh, when you actually accept that. And as opposed to worrying about not living up to any form of previous brand or standard or whatever, but never being happy with mediocrity and always looking to push yourself further forward, I think that's the key part. While I said I have this terrible time looking back and reflecting, I was always looking back and reflecting. And again, the pendulum swing now has me looking but forward. But do you mean you were doing that and... Comparing current comparing. self to former yeah, self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden I, the pendulum swung into the middle and I went, cool, well, you can't be former self. That person's gone. But also what have you learned since former self? And it was kind of like, holy cow, I'm actually so much more self-aware. And while I thought I was very emotionally intelligent and highly skilled and all this, which I was, but I wasn't actually that emotionally mature. You know, I wasn't even fully aware of what I needed to help myself feel value. I knew what I needed to do to help others feel value. But I was never in this place that was actually sustainable for me personally. And my sense of self was all over the place and nowhere at the level of potential it needed to be. And then my pendulum swung all the way forward and I threw myself into purpose. And now we're sort of resting back into that, that place whereby, you know, I'm, I am me. Uh, this is the whole thing. There's no brand other than myself. Uh, you know, we all have our own individual unique brand. And my brand is Heston Russell. And whatever that brand is, is whatever I choose it to be. And I can't influence what other people think that brand is. I just have to be happy with who that person is when I go to sleep, when I wake up. And every other time I look in the mirror to conduct a quick assessment of am I doing what I'm meant to be doing? Am I being good at my job and am I being a good person? So I think it's, again, to answer your question, coming back to appreciating what actually is important. Um, you know, and for me, it actually comes down to essentially health and happiness. And for me, I'd actually just refine it down to happiness. And it's not like, you know, ha-ha, the world is lovely happiness. It's like what do you need to feel physically, mentally and emotionally in a place whereby you have the potential to be performing 
at a healthy rate because you actually feel content with who you are and what you're doing, imperfections and all. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Sam's little reflection moment. <laughs> mm. So I've been reflecting. Okay. <laughs> I remember when I say that? Um, no, I want to go. I want to go more onto that because I think that's really good. But I have a question around your sense of self. Do you have pillars that hold these in place for the days that aren't your happy days or uh, days that you struggle to wake up? You know, like what's the pillars in place to make sure that you still remain connected to that sense of self? Very, very good. Uh, I mean, purpose is definitely one of those. And at the very start of this year, I actually did, I think the 1st of January, I actually did an Instagram post where I did a carousel of photos that uh, were purpose. And they were people in my life from uh, my family, uh, my grandfather, Scotty. uh, And every now and then when I do have those sort of slow days, I actually sort of wake up and I really do actually go back and review that. That wasn't just a a feel-good post for everyone else. That was a post for me. And that's sort of my accountability piece. Um, and there are so many things in there, particularly now, obviously Scotty gone and then my granddad gone and particularly so much of what he said to me in the conduct of this, you know, he was sort of a, alive for the first couple of months of this. There's that accountability piece, um, not wanting to do them proud, but just wanting to be a man of my word. Uh, because if you can't be counted on what you say and what you do, what can you be counted on? So um, there is that. And you know what? I've said it 400,000 times, but that little fluff ball my little copper 24 month old he's two years now Sam my little pup pup uh, again just so while I, you know looking at that purpose post will give me that mental and emotional purpose you know that that physical and emotional purpose is sort of tied up with him whereby you know he's dependent and relying on me you know, I have to get up and do things and and then again our community you know just to some days just want to fold it in it's like, no, you know, looking back through some of that impact that we've had and, you know, people who have responsibility to, but th- it's very careful here because you'll hear me keep saying this, all this purpose outside of self, purpose outside of self, purpose outside of self. And then it also just comes down to the fact that, um, you know, I know that deep down, if anything, I've learned over the last five, six, seven months that you never truly realised or, or know like where your story will finish or what your story will include. So this is going back to that sort of commando mindset and that infinite mindset in that I need to do what I can do when I have the time to make sure I'm ready for whatever. And it's sort of getting back to that, um, you know, what might you be needed for? How will you be best prepared to be that when, it calling, when the calling comes? And that's what really helps me focus on, um, you know, particularly my, my physical health, um, making sure that even when I don't feel like engaging my psychologist and having our weekly chat, like making sure I do because I'm focusing on a proactive preventative mindset as opposed to a reactive mindset and just really having that focus carry through everything that I do. Whereas too often, and particularly when the workload kicks up, it's so easy to find purpose reactively. You know, there's something to do. I've got to do this today. I've got to do this today. Whereas it's important for every now and then to sort of change the glasses and look through the lenses of preventative to make sure that I'm sort of filling up my own tank as well so still a balance still a balance what i hear you say though in all of those is actually not necessarily purpose outside of self it's actually mirroring the reason why you're doing something so the reason the the purpose post is your reason why you're getting up and doing that you're like copper is giving you a reason why you're right it comes down to purpose and also like on the hard days we spoke about this i think in the last podcast the hard days in military you all the things that you guys did in special forces you were connected to the reason why. That's what pushed you to keep going. And that's what's so important for me is that purpose. And it's so easy for people to say, oh, I'm sick of people always asking why and all this. But, you know, you've heard me say it on previous um, discussions, workshops, podcasts, task and purpose. If you enable people to understand why they need to do something, they might actually find a better way to do that or other tasks to do that. And, you know, it comes from a place of just understanding, being situationally aware in what the requirement is where you can actually put yourself into that to better understand it. And you're right. That's where my mindset is at the moment. I'm very difficult at, I find it very difficult to conduct things where I don't know the reason why. And that's fine. I'm actually okay with that. Uh, And sometimes you have to sort of go, well, I'm just going to do this because it needs to be done. (laughs) But I actually really appreciate my mindset always tries to go to, why does this need to be done? Not sort of questioning it, 
but actually knowing knowing something needs to be done, but then understanding the higher reason why that needs to be done. And that actually makes me more motivated to do that. It makes me have some emotional buy-in to this and being actually to have able to have some buy-in to the progression of that in order to um, achieve something. So I, I love that. And that, but again, that's a quite a, a military training piece, you know, every single time when you write um, your orders for a mission, your mission statement is who, what, when, where, why it ends with why. And that why statement is in order to, you know, you are to achieve this mission in order to blah, 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 blah. And that might be in order to support the local population. That might be in order to actually enable the element above you to help achieve their mission as a part of sort of this mission nesting that we go through in the military jargon. And in particular, as far as the practical, tactical application of the understanding of the purpose goes, in the event that the who, what, when, where of the mission completely break down, every single person who's receiving that orders briefing is understanding the why, the purpose, the in order to. And I've been on missions whereby we went to the wrong location at the wrong time and the wrong person was there and all this, but the team knew what we were there to do and they cracked on and got it done. Mm. You know, they say the no plan survives H hour. Well, the purpose of the plan should survive H hour. The purpose of their mission statement is what you know I need to put so much effort into because when all else fails, if I get killed or my radio goes down or I fall down a hole or whatever, you know, and all these, and all the commanders do that, um, every guy down to the number six in each team needs to understand the purpose and why we're trying to do that. That's cool. And I'm going to reflect it back to my position of how this impacts me. Oh, good. Because you're... The 360 degree reporting live <laughs> on the Voice of a Veteran podcast. Here we go. Your leadership is one of, you take me along on the journey, there's transparency and I understand why we're doing it, mm. which makes me so much more bought into the purpose of what we're doing True. instead of me sitting on the other end of... The laptop being like, ugh, bloody hair ceiling. I don't want to, you know. Yeah. I've never done that because I'm like, yes, I'm like right there with you. But even <laughs> even, that's, even that's a balance because, you know, you feel like, because there's stuff that I need only you to do mm. so it's not weighing me down. But then like, because back in again, our, our commando days on, on, on mission, you'd have an all-informed net where everyone could actually hear everything that's going on. And there'd be that discipline part that only the team commanders were the ones talking to me or two to each other to clear the net to make sure otherwise there weren't just voices going everywhere. But then it gets to the point whereby it's like, you know, Sam is actually, you. Sam does more work than me because you're doing this day-to-day stuff. And I'm like, do I need to be including her in all this? But that's coming down to that part. Like what will actually better enable her to have a better appreciation of the situation? It's because Sam's fantastic at reading into that and going, hey, well, that actually ties in with what we're trying to do here, here and here because you're dealing with all the information mm-hmm. and filtering it up to me as well. So... It's fascinating to hear that because sometimes I feel like I'm sending too much to you. But at the same time, I definitely do filter things that I know she literally can't help me out with that or doesn't need to help me out with that. So My turn. Yeah? <laughs> Teams change on the copper. Hey, Bubba. Hello. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I can reflect in the past of different work and stuff that I've had. And yeah. if I am not engaged if I'm not like motivated or inspired it's because typically I'm left in the dark I don't really know why we're doing it I don't really get inspired by that yeah so that's cool for leadership in general absolutely I think I've particularly overseas I've worked with a number of other nations uh, and uh, not just special forces but conventional forces and there's been a few missions that I went on where I remember I had to once jump up on a tank that was ramming its way through a civilian compound in Afghanistan. Uh, and a lot of these compounds, there's these giant brick, mud brick walls that stem around from the compound, from the house and make a whole compound. And uh, we were using the tanks to smack through these walls. Um, this is just after we'd lost Scotty um, on that same deployment. And as opposed to going through any... Paths. You know, we literally watched over 10,000 civilians march up over a hill to vacate the area. We knew it was only badlands for the next two to three days. And so I had had enough of walking through doorways and through paths and we either used our explosive method of entry to get through them or I just rammed, I had about four Abrams tanks, all those variants under my command, and we just rammed the tanks through the walls. Um, and they were loving it. But I sort of remember there was this tank and its branding on it was actually called Happy Tank. No, wrong. It was called Mr. Plough, the happy tank. And it had this big ploughing tool on the front of it. 
And next thing I just remember he was plowing through this wall. Like usually the commanders will tell them where we're going, but he just taken upon himself to start plowing through walls. And I looked over and I had a look at what he's doing and he plowed through on the wall that was actually joined to the compound. You know, it went all the way around. So next thing he's plowing into this compound and it'd be safe enough to say that, you know, there's no one in it because we watched most of the people get out of it. But he was just taking bite after bite after bite because you couldn't just plow straight through it. You know, going through wall after wall after wall. And I remember like trying to get on the phone. I remember like trying to grab the little comms phone at the back and then nearly getting rolled over by this tank because he had his hatch closed. So then I had to jump up and bang on this thing. I was like, what the hell are you doing? And he's like, I'm, I'm plowing through the wall, sir, giving you a point of entry. I was like, dude, who the hell told you to do that? It's like, oh no, no, just in case. I'm like, mate, get up here and have a look. And next thing you can see the front of his tank is, you know, in someone's living room. And uh, yeah, there was really a key moment for me to actually to sit in like, why are you playing through this wall? It's like to give you a method of entry. It was like, cool. I understand that you understand why you need to do this. But at the same time, who told you to go through here? It's like, oh, 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 no one, sir. I was like, great. So, mate, you might be going out there doing this of your own fruition, but if you're not linked in with a team, then you're operating on a purpose that isn't linked to anyone else. Your purpose is to provide a team with a method of entry. Your purpose is not to make method of entry all over the place. Oh, okay, no worries, sir. And it's a very, very small, small nuance, but... You know, you can sit back and as opposed to wanting to th- kick this dude in the face of being an idiot, you have to sit there going, he thought that he was truly operating off purpose because you actually hadn't been to script enough in le- letting him know the true reason, nesting it as to what his tactical application of that purpose was. And so that's where so many people can go very wrong in being very flavoursome in their purpose, enabling people to maximum creativity, which is also great but it's very, very key to really drill into making sure the person truly understands what their purpose is, but also in relation to others and in relation to the situation, in relation to a finite period as opposed to infinitely go forth and discover and invest that purpose to every letter of the sentence, even though it might not be irrelevant in that application. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Is this where situational awareness comes into it? That's it. Self-awareness, situational yeah. awareness and the balance between the two. I want to understand where, where this began for you. Like wh- how did you begin to – were you like this already before you got into the military? Or well, these are, self-awareness it- and situational awareness are like huge catchwords for the military. Yeah. Um, you know, self-awareness situ- – in particular, sorry, situational awareness. Military is all about situational awareness. From day one training, you need to like increase your situational awareness. You need to be looking at and you'd be focused. Like don't look down at the ground when you're patrolling, looking out through to on the commando selection course, you know, part of the criteria we are assessing people on and we build the modules, how to assess them on their situational awareness. Self-awareness is actually something that's not really brought into the military in that terminology. You know, even like your own dress and bearing and things like that is brought into situational awareness, like, you know, during the conduct of that movement, your epilep came undone or things like that, you need to have better situational awareness. The military is all about situational awareness. And then particularly doing some work to redevelop and redefine some of the stands on the selection course for the commando selection, working with some incredible um, civilian psychologists, psychiatrists, people who was really starting to hone into this emotional intelligence really comes down to self-awareness. Emotional intelligence is self-awareness. Your ability to understand yourself spiritually, mentally and emotionally as well as physically. So then it's incorporating the two. And, you know, I've spoken about this balance between um, the difference between confidence and arrogance, Um, you know, the application of yourself into something without any regard for the situational awareness when you're actually aware of that situation is arrogance, whereas being ignorant to the situation is potentially not arrogance because you're not doing it for your own self-purpose. So it's just so important and the key fundamentals, you know, the, the key things that make the best people the best special forces soldiers officers are those who are extremely situational aware but the next level of elitism is those who are extremely self-aware as well and are able to intrinsically link those two together for productive outcomes and that even then comes down to that human level because the more self-aware you are of yourself you're then able to actually better learn and be more empathetic to others by better understanding what their sense of self is and how they are physically, mentally and emotionally regulated 
and then apply both those considerations into the situational awareness to execute tasks or achieve purpose. Agreed. Okay. If you, you spend a lot of time com, 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 uh, what's that word? Compartmentalizing. You know that one? <laughs> I can't Big say that fish, word. little fish, cardboard box. Yeah. If you spend a lot of time doing that in military life, which you've spoken about before, how did that, how does that, I think that that is a huge impact on self awareness. Compartmentalization is trauma boxes or potential trauma boxes as opposed to education boxes. Yeah. So anything that could potentially impact on your ability to exercise or develop great situational awareness or particularly, uh, yeah, situational awareness or even self-awareness is put into those boxes and stored. Um, you know, critical incidents, potential uh, inferiority complexes or things like that, and you put them in that box and your sense of self comes from your uniform, your role, your task. So particularly so many of those emotional compartmentalization boxes come down to actually your sense of self compartmentalization. Or have big fish, little fish, cardboard box. So anything to do with like potential differences, potential things that could provide any form of personal uncertainty in the workplace or personal uncertainty for yourself, you put those in a box um, behind the screen of what is the sense of self you're provided with and that is the military person of you. And this is the key part I'm talking about is that your sense of self in service is this big all-encompassing identity that is the military version of you. And then when you leave that, you feel that you're only this part of this. And what happens is you are taken away from that all immersive and all supportive, supportive environment. And the luggage you take are all those little boxes, <laughs> all those little differences that you now have to you know, either appreciate and open. And in the process of opening them, you're actually presenting yourself with even more of these uncertainty at the same time where you're presented by all these other uncertainty levels that you have to go through to go back to the standard of living, the standard of employment, the standard of satisfaction, the standard of welfare, the standard of community, the standard of purpose that you had in service. And as opposed to going back to them, as it's just going back to the comparison of them. So you're going through all these multiple layers of unpacking furniture and taking on new furniture and unpacking boxes that, you know, you're just not prepared for. And this is the part we're trying to talk about so much in that what I've even realised backtracking through myself and having this conversation with so many others, and this is so important for everyone in any form of transition where they're going from a shift in who they are and who their identity is to potentially anything, it's consolidating and unpacking all those boxes, becoming comfortable with what's in those boxes, not just hiding them back in the basement. You know, that's your vulnerability moment. Hey, these are all my boxes. Sorry, it's pretty disappointing. Yes, I collect comic books. <laughs> Do you really? No, I don't. <laughs> I do have, I have a huge collection of like <laughs> basketball cards when I was a kid. I just found the other day. Anyway. And penthouse. <laughs> I have a penthouse magazine. You have 10. Okay. <laughs> it's pretty articles. It's actually very quickly for this audience is because we had an article <laughs> published in the recent penthouse magazine, not because I actually collect penthouse magazine. Mm, um, but they are, do have fantastic articles and I'd encourage you to get them and read <laughs> that. It's the uh, autumn 2011 edition. Uh, but yeah, it's being comfortable with, you know, what is unpacked from your boxes and potentially on display for people to come um, at a garage sale, essentially. Jeez. And yeah, being comfortable that, that that's you and that's your baggage and that's your luggage. And it's not a like, hey, this is me, like take it or leave it. It's like, hey, this is me. And it actually doesn't matter what other people think as long as it's not impacting on them. That's your self-awareness. This is me. And then it comes down to your responsibility to then apply that appropriately into the situation you're in. And that's what too many people, and you've seen it particularly in our community or people who really hold onto that trauma, they'll bring that trauma box out and they'll be like, hey, this is my trauma. Yeah, this is what I was yep. thinking. This is my yeah. trauma, you know. You need, to, you need to take this trauma or you need to validate, it. validate my trauma. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I will support you carrying that box, but that box has got your name on it, you know, and let me know how I can help you. As opposed to at the moment we have all these people like, you know, every person they make trauma box, trauma box, trauma box. Potatoing it. Yeah. So, but they don't let go of it. But is there it's a not process? potatoing it. It's this is my trauma box. Look into it. Look into my trauma box. But I feel like there's a lack of actually looking into it themselves. And so is there a process of before we go, hey, here's all my stuff. No, but there's plenty. I think there's plenty of people looking into other people's trauma boxes and then going, oh, you know, I'm sorry for you and all this. But there's not like a, cool, how can I help you with this? You know, what do yeah. you need to unpack that trauma box you know as opposed to it being something that defines you 
how can we literally unpack that, collapse that box down and put it in the recycling bin? That's because a lot of us feel that we, we have to be very delicate and you have to be delicate with other people's traumas, particularly as in a non-clinical aspect. But particularly when someone's been holding onto that trauma box for so long and it becomes a definition of them, how can we assist that person to then harness that trauma box as a responsibility or as an opportunity for them to then be productive and proactive with that? What would be a tangible example of what someone might be carrying in a trauma box and the process of them, okay, it's time for me to look into it myself yes. and integrate it, so accept it, yep. and then move on to the next part. Like, what's, an, what's a tangible example for people to understand what that might be? I think first and foremost, it's very important to note that particularly when you have had one or many of these trauma boxes for so long, it's not just simply as easy as, like I said before, very flippantly, and I don't mean to be, unpacking it, locking it down and moving it back and recycling the box. Uh, particularly if it's been sitting there for so long, you know, let's just talk about a cardboard box sitting in the garage. It might be a bit wet, a bit damp. There's probably at least a, a, a um, discoloration outline. There might be a bit of mould where that box was sitting. Um, you know, there's definitely a lasting imprint of where that box was. What might be in that box? So what might be in that box is your own personal trauma. And this is coming down to, you know, my dealings with DVA over the last two years, you know. That so is, you put that in a box? That is my emotionally triggering box because I get emotionally triggered uh, when I get a call from a delegate and all things like this. And the piece now is, and it's a great segue to where we're at in the community and why I advocated so hard for this Royal Commission, is that that is now the outlet. The responsibility piece now is for me to put all these fantastic words and conversations and stories and recollections I've had of my trauma into a document into a document that contains everything. And that might take me months to do. But as opposed to grabbing my trauma box and showing everyone else, I now had to sit my trauma box down, open it up and go through every single piece and itemize that trauma box and do it, check it twice, check it three times, read it through. If I'm comfortable finding someone else to read that through, so as when I submit that to the Royal Commission, someone who has no idea who I am can pick that up and can at least understand that what the key issues are and then can contact me to come forward and say more. And the key part in this, particularly when dealing with emotional trauma, is to conduct that inventory, write that down, and then give it a few days, come back and reread it, reread it five, six, seven, or ten times because the first time we write that, it's going to be full of emotion. You know, the dust, the emotional dust that's on each of those objects I'll pull out is going to fall onto the page. Every subsequent time I need to go back through and remove it, you know, because I don't want the person on the other end to simply see it as a emotive outburst and not be able to dive into the objective facts that they need to actually go through and conduct a critical analysis and provide options for systemic resolutions to these things. And I even do it every now and then myself. That afternoon where I contemplated suicide, I wrote an email and I sent it out to uh, a number of members of parliament. I sent it to my local member, Tanya Plibersek. I sent it to Jackie Lambie. I sent it to Andrew Hasty. Uh, I CC'd a bunch of other people. And that email contained every little bit of detail I wanted. But it was so emotive. And it was reading it back myself. It is like, holy cow, you know, I don't know what to do. I want to my mindset as opposed to going to, right, something needs to be done is like, right, this person needs to be supported. You know, and that's my own failings, but that's my own learnings in how emotive these things are and appreciating that that's where it, that sits and that's where trauma comes from. That's what trauma can do. And it's so important for us to support each other, even listening that, to understand that there are tens, hundreds of thousands of veterans and families who are about to go through finally unpacking some of those boxes that have been sitting in the corner of their minds, of their hearts for so long. And just like unpacking your own apartment, it's so much easier doing it with someone. And there might be a few boxes in there that we are not yet vulnerable or comfortable enough with unpacking around other people. And that's why writing it down, literally writing it down, either in an email or in a letter, hopefully in an email, so you can actually go back through and edit and not rewrite it a hundred times. 
is such a great part because even when you're putting it out there, you're actually putting it out there mm. for the first time physically. Yeah. And it's not another person, but it's another thing. You're reading your story back as opposed to knowing and assuming your story. And your level of comfort in being vulnerable simply that it's on a piece of paper that, you know, if you died tomorrow, someone might find that piece of paper. There's just a level of comfort for me that came slowly through rewriting that letter and that I've been doing. I've rewritten that letter about 10 times now and need to keep adding to it um, as the situations continue. And then finally getting to a point of finding that right person saying like, hey man or hey girl, you just have a look at that, this for me. And you know what? In doing so and collaborating and supporting each other in this, if you're comfortable in doing so, you might help someone else feel vulnerable enough to find that courage and, and do it themselves or even just help them structure that. And, you know, as we talk about the next steps for Voice of Veteran and Veteran Support Force, that's even if we are just able to potentially help people find someone that they're comfortable to help them write down what they've got because you know it yourself, Sam, some of these men and women that we've spoken to are not at a level of emotional stability to be able to sit down and do that. And we need to be so careful asking them to do that. We need to proactively appreciate that. We can't just say the purpose is to get as much information in because the purpose is also to support and help them individually and collectively in this healing process we're talking about. And there might be so many people that aren't willing to open up the box yet, right? Mm -hmm. And I know they need to right now. Absolutely. And it's so important that they share that and we have this opportunity for them to do so. But what about if they're just so, like, they're just not ready? That's it. And, you know, that's where we definitely need to and have spoken about appreciating that as well. And the best thing we can do at our individual level is leadership by example. Mm -hmm. You know, do your part. Look out for others that you can help do their part. And also appreciate some of these things take time. You know, if everyone is not ready to provide their submissions the first week the Royal Commission goes live, that's okay. Mm. Because... As time goes on, people may grow and become more immersed in this process and appreciate, wake up that one day and be like, hey, you know, today's the day I feel strong enough. And that's where we need to make sure and what we're trying to do next in the veteran community and just in everyday support community for anyone out there is to identify that, you know, that day might come where we are able to then support them in that actual process and we need to be able to. And also that once they've done that process and once they've submitted that, that's where another level of vulnerability comes from. You know, holy cow, someone else is reading this, someone that I don't overly feel vulnerable with, but it's for the purpose of supporting our community and supporting our families. And, you know, they might have that that guilt collapse in, they might have that shame creep back in, they might have this doubt creep back in, what have I done? Or it might have stirred up emotions in doing so. And that's great, again, to, c- to keep working through. Because even a, even when you deal with trauma, there's actually a grieving process in dealing with trauma itself as well. And to appreciate there are these phases we need to look out and help each other out with as well. And anyone who's been through any form of process, be that a, an acute traumatic incident, through to finally accepting that something was traumatic or finally accepting something wrong with themselves. It's actually a grieving process. And this is where, again, we need to be proactive and reactive if they need extra help to reach out, but more proactive in our everyday surroundings. For people listening to this, if you know a veteran, you know, reach out and find a veteran. You know, figure out if your next door neighbour is a veteran or is a family of a veteran who is going to be contributing to this Mm. and start setting up those proactive networks and communities because that's where we provide those protective parameters and layers of reactive and proactive resilience to help each other. I would I would think that calling you and telling you something telling telling you a trauma box for me mm. would be way more vulnerable for me than to write it down for someone that I don't know that's going to read it. You know what I mean? Like when there's some when you have to call you people that you love and that you know and that know you well, it's actually way more vulnerable to bring your, your stuff up. You're actually 100% correct. And so it could be the, the biggest obstacle or hurdle first that if someone has that person to, to yeah. do that with yep. and then the process becomes easier because you've got it out. You're 100% correct. Let's even go back to me admitting that I wanted to take my own life. I wrote that email to yeah. a bunch of people. Andrew, hasty on you, but... I BCC'd on him on that email because 
he was in that portfolio and position or he was in the political position. But yeah, I was so much more comfortable just telling complete strangers. And then to tell you, because that, that was for a purpose, because I needed them to take action. Yeah. Whereas me going to tell my mum and my sister, because I thought they're going to take this on board. They're going to think that they missed something. I don't want them to be scared of me. I don't want them looking at me differently. You're absolutely right. I mean, great. You even just helped open my eyes up there. And that's the whole process here. Perhaps we're better to make sure that indeed we're there ready to proactively support. But at the same time, appreciate that some people might simply need to, as a part of that process, conduct their initial input. And then by simply being out there and doing things proactively in the environment, in the community, have them the ability to, to self-engage as opposed to us looking to... Well, that's it. I think the whole thing is providing us with the opportunity to opt in. And we said this at the conference the other Friday, everything is opt in. Everything has to be opt in. Compelling people to be involved in this is, you know, that potential trauma piece. Yeah. But also, it's still a good proactive approach to go out and start building the relationship yeah. and trust and, and opening the conversation. Like, hey, if you ever need to... Culture and community right is a here. force field that protects you and the net that catches you. Yeah. And you and it has to start somewhere, you know. You, let's provide that template that is ready to either protect or catch people when they need it. Yeah, That's the plan. Cool. Well... That was good. That was really good, Tim. I really appreciate it. What are we going to talk about next time? Ah, uh, you'll have to tune in. <laughs> So again, thank you for again for listening to this episode of the Voice of the Veteran podcast. Um, thank you again to Sam for really bringing out these questions. And Absolutely. And thanks for everyone who's writing questions in. Feel free to keep DMing me. That's it. So remember, uh, this podcast is available on any and all streaming platforms. Uh, you can access it via the Voice of a Veteran website, voiceofaveteran.org slash podcast, or via our links on any of our social media, Instagram, Facebook, and even on LinkedIn when we remember to do that as well. So thank you so much and please use this again to get ready, support each other, take that time to have your own mental fitness session, embrace some of your own vulnerability or just chew a bit of time that's you investing in you as opposed to for any other proactive or productive purpose. See you next time. See ya.